Hello everyone, this is Arya from EduRecord. Today's video is all about interview questions that are asked for cybersecurity personnel. So today's video will be actually divided into two parts. The first part will actually cover all the general questions that are asked for cybersecurity jobs. And the next part will cover the scenario-based questions that are asked in such interviews. Okay, so let's get started. So the first question is, what do you mean by cyber? In an unauthorized way, data can get leaked through various ways, that is emails, prints, laptops getting lost, unauthorized upload of data to public portals, removable drives, photographs, etc. A few controls can be restricting uploads on internet websites, following an internal encryption solution, restricting the mails to internal networks, or restriction on printing confidential data, etc. Moving on to the next question, which is what is ARP and how does it work? Okay, so address resolution protocol or ARP is a protocol for mapping an internet protocol address to a physical machine address that is recognized on the local network. On the topic of how it works, when an incoming packet destined for a host machine on a particular local area network arrives at a gateway, the gateway asks the ARP program to find a physical host or MAC address that matches the IP address. Now the ARP program looks into the ARP cache and if it finds the address, it provides it so that the packet can be converted to the right packet length and format and send it to the machine. Now, if no entry is found for the IP address, ARP broadcasts a request packet in a special format to all machines on the LAN to see if one machine knows that it has the IP address associated with it. So for question number 35 is, what is 2FA and how can it be implemented for the public websites? So an extra layer of security that is known as multi-factor authentication requires not only a password and username, but also something that only and only that user has on them. That is a piece of information only they should know or have immediately to hand, such as a physical token. Authenticator apps replace the need to obtain verification code via text, voice call, or email. For example, to access a website or web-based service that supports Google Authenticator, the user types in their username and password. That is a knowledge factor. Okay, now time for question number 36, which is what techniques can we use to prevent brute force login attacks? So here the attacker tries to determine the password for a target through a permutation of fuzzing process. As it is a lengthy task, attackers usually employ software such as Fuzzer to automate the process of creating numerous passwords to be tested against target. To avoid such attacks, password best practices should be followed mainly on critical resources like servers, routers, exposed services, and so on. Okay, so now time for the next question, which is what is cognitive cybersecurity? Now the applications of artificial intelligence technologies pattern on human thought process to detect threats and protect its physical and digital system. Self-learning security systems use data mining, pattern recognition, and natural language processing to simulate the human brain, albeit in a high-powered computer model. This is exactly what cognitive cybersecurity is. So what is port blocking within LAN? Well, restricting the users from accessing a set of services within the local area network is called port blocking. Stopping the source to not to access the destination node via ports as applications work on the port, so ports are blocked to restrict the access, filing up the security holes in the network infrastructure. Okay, so time for question number 39, which is what is the difference between VPN and VLAN? Okay, so VPN is related to remote access to the network of a company, while VLAN basically means to logically segregate networks without physically segregating them with various switches. Now, while VPN saves the data from prying eyes while in transit and no one on the net can capture the packets and read the data, VLAN does not involve any encryption technique, but it is only used to slice up your logical network into different sections for the purpose of management and security. Okay, so it's time for question number 40. So the question is, what protocols fall under the TCP IP internet layer? Okay, so I'll be going through the five layers that consist the TCP IP protocol, and I'll also be listing out the protocols that are inside every layer. So starting with the physical layer, the protocols that reside in the physical layer are the Ethernet IEEE 802.3 and the RS-232 from one of the many protocols. And moving on to the data link layer, we have the Triple P protocol, the IEEE 802.2 protocol. Then moving on to the network layer, it's governed by the IP protocol, the ARP protocol, which is basically the address resolution protocol and the ICMP protocol. Then moving on ahead is the transport layer. Now the transport layer has two main protocols, namely the TCP and the UDP protocols. 
And last but not least, we have the application layer, which is governed by a multiple of protocols, namely NFS, NIS Plus, DNS, Telnet, FTP, RIP, SNMP, and various other protocols as such. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the general interview questions that might be asked in any cybersecurity interview. So now moving on to the scenario based questions. So first I'll be reading out the scenario and then I'll ask the questions regarding the scenario too. Okay, so for scenario number one we have you receive the following email from help desk. So the email goes as follows. Dear UCSE email user beginning next week. We will be deleting all inactive email accounts in order to create space for more users. You are required to send the following information to continue using your email account. If we do not receive this information from you by the end of the week, your email account will be closed. So then the email actually goes on to ask the various credentials like name, email, login, password, DOB, and alternate email. And then it says, please contact the webmail team with any questions and thank you for your immediate attention. So in such a scenario, what do you do and justify your actions for doing so? Okay, so this email is a classic example of phishing trying to trick you into biting. The justification is the generalized way of addressing the receiver, which is used in mass spam mails. Above that, a corporate company will never ask personal details on mail. They want your information, so don't respond to the mail, instant message, text, phone calls, etc., asking you for your password or other private information. You should never disclose your password to anyone, even if they say they work for the UCSC, ITS, or any other campus organization. Moving on to the next scenario, which is a friend sends an electronic Hallmark greeting card to your work email. You need to click on the attachment to see the card. What do you do and justify your actions? Well, this one has four big risks. Firstly, some attachments contain viruses or other malicious programs. So just in general, it's risky to open unknown or unsolicited attachments. Secondly, also in some cases, just clicking on a malicious link can infect a computer. So unless you are sure a link is safe, don't really click on it. Third, email addresses can be fake. So just because the email says it is from someone you know, you can't be certain of this without checking with the person. Fourth, finally, some websites and links look legitimate, but they're really hoaxes designed to steal your information. So what we have to do is actually not click on the email and actually ignore it completely. Moving on to the next scenario, which is one of the staff members in ITS subscribes to a number of free IT magazines. Among the questions she was asked in order to activate her subscriptions, one magazine asked her for a month of birth, a second asked for a year of birth, and a third asked for a mother's maiden name. What do you infer is going on in the situation and justify? Well, all three newsletters probably have the same parent company or are distributed through the same service. The parent company or service can combine individual pieces of seemingly harmless information and use or sell it for identity theft. Then it is even possible that there is a fourth newsletter that asks for a day of birth as one of the activation questions. Often questions about personal information are optional. In addition to being suspicious about situations like the one described here, never provide personal information when it is not legitimately necessary or to people or companies you don't personally know. So now time for scenario number four. Well, in our computing labs and departments, print billing is often tied to users login. People log in, they print, and then they get a bill. Sometimes people call to complain about bills for printing they never did, only to find out that the bills are indeed correct. So what do you infer is going on in the situation and justify your inference? Sometimes they realize they loaned their account to a friend who couldn't remember his or her password, and the friend did the printing and thus the charges. It's also possible that somebody came in from behind them and used their account. Now, this is an issue with shared or public computers in general. If you don't log out of the computer properly when you leave, someone else can come in from behind and retrieve what you were doing and use your accounts. Always log out of accounts, quit programs, and close browser windows before you walk away from a general public computer. Now, moving on to scenario number five, we have that we saw a case a while back where someone used their Yahoo accounts at a computer lab on a campus. She made sure her Yahoo account was no longer open in the browser window before leaving the lab. Now someone came in behind her and used the same browser to reaccess her accounts. They started sending emails from it and caused all sorts of mayhem. So what do you think might have gone wrong here? Well, the first person probably didn't log out of her account, so the new person could just go into the history and access it. Secondly, another possibility is that she did log out 
but didn't clear her web cache. This is done through the browser menu to clear pages that the browser has saved for future use. Time for scenario number six now. Okay, so two different offices on campus are working to straighten out an error and an employee's bank account due to a direct deposit mistake. Office number one emails the correct account and deposit information to office number two, which promptly fixes the problem. The employee confirms with the bank that everything has indeed been straightened out. So what is exactly wrong here? Well, account and deposit information is sensitive data that could be used for identity theft. Sending this or any kind of sensitive information by email is very, very risky because email is typically not private or secure. Anyone who knows how can access it anywhere along its route. So as an alternative, the two offices could have called each other or worked with the ITS to send the information in a more secure fashion. Okay, moving on to the next scenario, which is the mouse on your computer screen starts to move around on its own and click on things on your desktop. What do you do in such a situation? A, call your coworker over so they can see. B, disconnect your computer from the network. C, unplug your mouse. D, tell your supervisor. E, turn the computer off. F, run an antivirus, or G, all of the above. So we have to select all the options that apply in the situation. So the options that apply are B and D, which is basically disconnect your computer from the network and tell your supervisor. So this is definitely suspicious. Immediately report the problem to your supervisor and the ITS support center. Also, since it seems possible that someone is controlling the computer remotely, it is best if you can disconnect the computer from the network and turn off wireless if you have it until help arrives. If possible, don't turn off the computer. Okay, time for scenario number eight. So below are a list of passwords pulled out of a database. Now, which of the following passwords meet the UCSC's password requirement? Okay, so the third password, which is option number C, is the only one that meets all the following of the UCSC's requirement. It has at least eight characters in length, it contains at least three of the following four types of characters, which are lowercase characters, uppercase characters, numbers, and special characters. And not a word is preceded or followed by a digit. So it's the third option, which is correct in this situation. Moving on to the second last scenario we have for today is you receive an email from your bank telling you there is a problem with your account. The email provides instructions and a link so you can log in to fix your account and fix the problem in doing so. So what should you do? Well, we have to delete the email and better yet, use the web client that is Gmail, Yahoo Mail, etc., and report it as spam or phishing and then delete it. Any unsolicited email or phone call asking you to enter your account information, disclose your password, financial account information, social security number, or any other private or personal information is suspicious, even if it appears to be from a company you are familiar with. Always contact the sender using a method you know is legitimate to verify that the message is indeed from them. Okay, so it's time for our last scenario of the day, which is a while back, the IT folks got a number of complaints that one of our campus computers was sending out Viagra spam. They checked it out and the reports were true. A hacker had installed a program on the computer that made it automatically send out tons of spam email without the computer's own knowledge. So how do you think the hacker got into the computer to set this up? Well, this was actually the result of a hacked password using passwords that can be easily guessed and protecting your password by not sharing them or writing them down can help to prevent this. Passwords should be at least eight characters in length and use a mixture of uppercase, lowercase letters and numbers and symbols. Even though in this case it was a hacked password, other things could possibly lead to this are that out of date patches and updates, the lack of an antivirus software or an out of date antivirus software or clicking on an unknown link or attachment or downloading unknown or unsolicited programs onto your computer. Okay guys, so that was it for the session on cybersecurity interview questions. If you all have any questions regarding any of the questions that were discussed here, please put a comment down below. If you all also want the PowerPoint presentation that's shown out here, you all can also comment for that. And if you all want any other cybersecurity related specific interview questions, please do comment for that. I'll make a video on them soon. That's it from me, goodbye.